So let's turn our attention to the sequence of layers expressed in the buttes and the mesas of Monument Valley. So there are really five or so main geologic formations. The most dominant one is the cliff forming sandstone. It's the Deche sandstone. It's upper lower Permian. And uh, it's named for Canyon de Chez in, in East Central Arizona. Below that is a unit that's called the Oregon Rock Shale. And it's, it forms the pedestals. And you can see it's got a lot of fine grain material, but it's got some little sand layers in it as well that are making the little edges. Below the Oregon Rock, but really not very visible, maybe a little bit back in, in some of these places back here, there's another cliff forming sandstone that kind of forms the whole bottom of the valley, and it's called the Cedar Mesa sandstone. Uh, it's also, uh, also uh, early Permian. And that's kind of the bottom that you see. On top of the cliff forming sandstone, on top of the Deche, you can see there are some ledges of a, of, a, of a reddish brown unit, and then there's an upper cliff. On top of these buttes, depending on where you are, there are two units. There is the early Triassic uh, Moenkopi formation, and then there's the late Triassic Chinle formation. The basal formation of the Chinle is a, a really resistant basal conglomerate called the Shinarump. And, uh, and so some of these, these buttes get all, all the way up into the Shinarump, and then the, the upper part of the Chinle is, is really easily eroded shales. It's the material that makes the Painted Desert and the Petrified Forest National Park. And it's got a lot of volcanic ash in it, so it's really easy to strip it off. So that unit's locally in the region present, but is not typically present in the views. The Deche, as you can see, it forms basically an unbroken cliff. And I always teach students, if you see a unit that forms an unbroken cliff and it's made of sandstone, it's nearly always a unit that was deposited by the wind. The reason for this is the wind is, is moving sand, but finer material gets blown out, coarser material gets left behind. So when you have sand dunes migrating across the countryside, you're just making sand. And so it's really hard to make discrete layers that stand out if all you're working with is sand. Now there would be layers in here if you got the right, you can see some hints of layers in here. Uh, and there would be cross beds in here, the curved beds that are associated with, in this case, wind. Uh, so those layers would be there, but they're not very obvious. So in general, when you see a big unbroken cliff, whether it's here or in Canyonlands or Zion National Park, uh, those, those kind of rocks are usually deposited by the wind. The Oregon Rock Shale, or Oregon Rock Formation, depending on what your preference is, uh, is regarded as an equivalent of the hermit shale in the Grand Canyon. And uh, very few people doubt that, that correlation. And you can see it's got a lot of fine grained silts and muds. And, and the hermit shale commonly is called the hermit formation because it's got a lot of silt and it's not all shale. So uh, anyway, so that's the equivalent of that. The Cedar Mesa sandstone below is considered to be an equivalent of the Esplanade sandstone, the upper cliffy unit of the Supai group in Grand Canyon. So you essentially have a, a sequence that's Supai, Hermit, and then Deche is, is clearly a unit that's not expressed in the Grand Canyon. Uh, some people think it might be Coconino, but I think there's a lot of evidence that it's a slightly older unit than the Coconino, and the Coconino overlies it in places over like by Canyon Deche. And so, so you're kind of looking at the, at the same interval of red rocks that you see in the, uh, in the Grand Canyon. But slight differences in what units are present. Because things like, like big sand seas that deposit something like the Deche, they don't go on forever. And so the Deche sand sea did not make it to the Grand Canyon, did not make it to central Arizona. It was pretty much restricted in this particular part of the region near the Four Corners. So how about the top two units? The Moenkopi is considered to be pretty much a, a near sea level tidal flat, uh, especially as you go further west, and then low level kind of fluvial rocks, they're sand, sandy units and, and silty units, so floodplain and channel deposits, uh, fluvial. And again, that's an, that's an early Triassic rock. 
And then the Shinarump is it's a conglomerate, and it's very clearly a fluvial rock and, uh, and terrestrial. And at that time, the Cordilleran Arc was really putting out a lot of volcanic ash. And so the rocks above the, the Shinarump and the rest of the Chinle, they're loaded with volcanic ash. People have done a lot of work on those rocks. They get zircons that are like 220 million years out of it. And uh, so you're going from a relatively quiet tectonic period in here represented by the Permian rocks and by the late Triassic rocks. And then by the time you go into the Chinle formation, you're starting to, to see expressions of all the tectonic activity associated with subduction along the west coast of North America. Although they're not in this scene, on top of the Chinle, there are a whole sequence of rocks called the Glen Canyon Group. And that includes the, the Navajo sandstone and the Cayenta and some of those other really well-known formations of the Colorado Plateau. They're, they were here, and they were eroded away, and you know they're gone. Likewise, this sandstone, the Deche, is a remnant of an extensive layer that co once covered the whole area, was compacted and made into a hard rock, and then has now been eroded into the various landscape features you see.